Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you will make a way, you can make a way, you have made a way. And so God, I pray now for the person whose hand I hold, show yourself strong on behalf of my brother, my sister. And I thank you, God, that whatever they're facing, that they have the blessed assurance that the Lord is on their side. And so bless this person, God, in profound ways. I pray now that as your word goes forth, that God, that you would save and heal, strengthen, even deliver in this place. Oh God, get the glory because you're in a class by yourself. Let fresh anointing be upon our lives. And God, I ask as always that you'll let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Why don't you put your hands together and let's give the Lord a hand and clap for praise. God be praised. If y'all will give me just a little volume on this mic, please. Thank you so much. God be praised. I greet you again in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, beloved, as we prepare to receive the word of God, I'm asked that everyone would stand on your feet. And as you stand, I pray that you would take your Bible, hold it in your hand, and raise your Bible. If you don't, if you're using an iPhone with the Bible in it, raise your iPhone. If you got an iPad, raise your iPad. I know this is the age of technology. And if you just repeat after me, the Bible in my hand is the Word of God. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God, I thank you for your word. Now, if you'll take your Bible, open it up to the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. We want to start reading with the first verse. Ushers, allow those in the concourse to join us very, very, very quickly. Hebrews chapter 8, reading the first verse or beginning with the first verse are you there the word reads like this now this is the main point of the things we are saying we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second because finding fault with them he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his, his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins, and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant. 
He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As we prepare to give you this word today and the lesson that God would have us to learn, uh, let's put a tag on this text so that as you seek to secure this CD in the future that you will be able to hear this message again and let it bring spiritual edification to your lives. If you turn to the person beside you, look them right in the face and tell them you are never alone. Look at somebody else and tell them, I said, you are never alone. Amen. Look at someone else and tell them, say, I'm going to shout about that in about 20 minutes. <laughs> you are never alone. One of the most profound revelations that we receive from the Bible is the revelation that is given to us in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. This revelation is profound, it is pertinent, it is powerful because it reminds us that as we make our Christian pilgrimage that we are never alone because the Lord Jesus Christ is walking with us and he is on our side. If you have been a Christian for some time now, I'm sure that you have come to the realization that your spiritual sojourn is not a hundred yard dash, but rather it is a cross country run. In fact, the writer of this very epistle says to us in chapter 12, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer of Hebrews describes metaphorically uh, this spiritual sojourn that we are on as a race. He looked at the Roman Greco world where they had the Olympiad races and, and games and he said that our Christian pilgrimage is like one of the runners who are in a cross-country run. And the fact of the matter is that you and I try to live this Christian life as we seek to run our race. Sometimes the road does get rough. Sometimes the goings get tough. And sometimes the hills are hard to climb. On this race, the wind is not always at your back. Sometimes you have to face headwinds and contrary winds. On this race, the day will get dark and the night will get dreary. On this race, you have to deal with trials and troubles and temptations. On this race, you have difficulties and disappointments. On this race, you can be ridiculed and rejected. On this race, you can stumble and fall. But the good news this morning is to understand that while all of these challenges are a part of this race, that you are never alone. Because the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand, as he did these early Christian believers, he wants us to understand that on one hand, Jesus Christ is our blessed Redeemer, but on the other hand, Jesus Christ is also our great high priest. He wants us to be clear on the fact that it was God in Christ who has secured our salvation, but that very Christ who secured our salvation is the Christ who is sustaining us and strengthening us for our spiritual sojourn. You don't have to go through this world thinking that you got to make it on your own. You got a God on your side. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 8 is further giving us explanation of who Jesus is as our great 
high priest. Now, the key verse in this pericope of Scripture that I read is verse 6. Look at it again, verse 6. But now he, that is Jesus, has attained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. The writer says that Jesus, as our mediator, a mediator is one who represents two parties. Jesus, as our mediator, on one hand, the writer says, he is the highest revelation, the highest um, uh, 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 spiritual uh, revelation that we have ever received of God in the world. On the other hand, Jesus Christ represents us before the Father as our advocate. He is our great high priest and that he now represents us as the mediator of a new covenant that is based on better promises. And, and, and the writer in this text, he has already been explaining to us who Jesus Christ is as our great high priest. He begins in chapter 4 talking about Jesus as a great high priest who identifies with our infirmities and shares in with our sufferings. He begins to talk about Jesus as one who comes to us after the order of Melchizedek. And then he begins to deal with it in a very substantive manner in chapter 7 when the writer says that Jesus as our great high priest did not come after the priesthood of Aaron and the Levitical priesthood but as one who came through the seed of David he did not come through the tribe of Levi but Jesus came through the tribe of Judah so that he says that Jesus came after the order of Melchizedek and that the Bible says that Melchizedek having neither mother nor father nor beginning nor ending of days he is talking about the eternal of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. He goes on and, uh, and clarifies for us that Jesus is a high priest with an indestructible life because as our high priest, he's also our blessed redeemer. That he was the one who secured our salvation when he laid down his life on a cross one Friday on a hill called Calvary. He was buried in another man's tomb, but he got up Sunday morning with all power in his hands so that he has an indestructible life. Celebrating 30 years of service unto the Lord and his people. We start our celebration on Wednesday, September 11th for Bible study with Bishop Noel Jones. You got it! Do something with it! Let the devil know I know what I got! I know who I am! Guest psalmist Leandria Johnson returns to bless the house with praise. Gala from 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall, Friday, September 13th. Tickets are available today at $10 per person. The Dreamers Gala, an intimate evening with Pastor and our First Lady. Sunday, September 15th, we will show our appreciation during 8 and 11 a.m. services with a word from Bishop Paul S. Morton. Don't miss out on this year's Pastor's Appreciation, celebrating 30 years of service unto the Lord and his people.
Jesus Christ was both the lamb and the high priest. He went into the holy of holies. He did not take the blood of a lamb, but he took his own blood and then offered it as a sacrifice on our behalf, but then got up Sunday morning and then declared that he is the hero of Calvary and he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. So that he begins now to take us to another step, to another level. Now in this text, the writer is going to help us to understand two important things about Jesus Christ as our great high priest. And I'm telling you now, this is shouting information. Because on one hand, he's going to explain to us that Jesus Christ as our mediator represents, he represents a new covenant with better promises. And when you look at verse 7 through 13, he explains the promises, the better promises that are part of the new covenant that God has offered to us in Christ. But before he explains the promises in verses 1 through 5, he speaks to us again about the person of Jesus and the position of Jesus. Because if I don't understand Jesus in terms of his personhood and in terms of his position, I might overlook the promises. If I don't understand who Jesus is in his person and his position as my great high priest, I might take the promises for granted and not access what is available to me. So the writer wants us to be clear about who Jesus is as our great high priest. Now look at verse 1 in chapter 8. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. Stop right there. The writer says, now I've been talking to you about Jesus as the great high priest. I've already told you that he doesn't come after the order of Aaron or the Levitical priesthood and that he comes after the order of Melchizedek. He is a Melchizedekian priest. I've already told you that he has an indestructible life. I've already told you that he is the one who is strengthening and sustaining you on your spiritual sojourn. He says, this is the essence of what I'm trying to tell you this is the bottom line that you have a great high priest you may not see him now because you are a second generation of believers and Jesus has already been resurrected he has already ascended back to glory but while you don't see him with the naked eye he's still serving you as your great high priest the writer wants them to be clear on something that Jesus as your blessed redeemer has already secured your salvation you don't see him now in the flesh but he's still working on your behalf let me say it again he says to them that Jesus Christ as your blessed redeemer has already secured your salvation through his death on the cross. You don't see him now in the naked eye because he's already ascended back to glory. But he's still working on your behalf. I'm trying to give you your place to shout early today. Jesus Christ was crucified over 2,000 years ago. He secured, if you are a Christian today, he secured your salvation a long time ago. But while he took care of it and fixed it over 2,000 years ago, he's working for you right now. He's working for you right now. And see, this would have meant a whole lot to these second generation of Jewish uh, Christians in, in the time that the writer of Hebrews is writing this letter. Because you see, they had moved Joan from their old Judaistic religion and they had now accepted the progressive revelation of God in Christ and understood that Jesus now was the source of their salvation. And they understood now that he is ministering to them as their great high priest. They were used to seeing the high priest go into the temple, go into the Holy of Holies, take the blood of a lamb and slay it and sprinkle it on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And, and, and now that they have accepted Jesus Christ, because there are others who have not accepted him, there are still others who are participating and practicing the Judaistic faith. Even in their current day and time, there was still priests going into the temple 
and taking the blood of a lamb and going behind the veil to offer it as a sacrifice on behalf of the people. But these now second generation Jewish believers understand that I don't need that anymore. I don't need a priest to go behind the veil anymore and take the blood of the lamb and put it on the altar because that has already been taken care of. But I am grateful to know that while I don't need anyone to go in the temple now and go behind the veil and take the blood of a lamb and put them, I am glad that I still have a high priest. So, so, so look at what the writer says. He, he says in verse 1, he says, We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one <coughs> also have something to offer. In other words, what the writer of Hebrews wants them to understand and what he wants us to realize as Christians today is that when you realize that Jesus is your great high priest, he is not ministering on the earthly realm. He's serving as a high priest, but he's ministering on the heavenly realm. In other words, he's your high priest, but he is the transcendent high priest. He is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he's not sitting down because he's tired. He's sitting down because the work has been finished. You do remember that when he died on the cross at Calvary, Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say he was finished. He said, it is finished. In other words, I've already paid the price for your redemption. So now I can sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Underscore the fact he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high because he is the only begotten of the Father. That God has made himself known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that Paul says in the Philippians that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He sits down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The writer is trying to remind us that Jesus as our great high priest as the transcendent Christ that God is transcendent and he is imminent God is with us but never forget that while he's with you he's still at the same time above you come on he's with me but while he's with me he's always above me and it doesn't matter how close he is when he's with me I must never forget the fact that he is above me because I need to know always that he's above me because of what I'm gonna need him to handle for me oh, I got to be careful because I'm teaching and I'm not supposed to cross this line he is with me but he is above me he is the transcendent Christ and you see it makes a difference in terms of how you perceive God. In other words, if I asked you, how do you see Jesus? What is he to you? If you have a itsy bitsy God, if you have uh, an impotent God, if you have a finite God, if you have a God who you see in your own or, uh, uh, anthropomorphic features, uh, then maybe your God doesn't seem to be too much to you. And maybe our problem is that is how we perceive Jesus. Maybe the reason we don't pray is because we really don't believe he's got the capability to handle uh, what's going on in our lives. Maybe that's why our prayer life is so sporadic. Maybe that's why we are praying ineffectual prayers because we don't have the right perception about who our God and who our Christ is. But let me remind somebody today that he ain't like you. He's not like me. He's above us. He is the transcendent God. He is the sovereign God. And when I tell you he's sovereign, that means he is is omnipotent he's got all power when I say he's the sovereign God that means that he's omniscient he knows everything whatever ambush you did not ambush him even if he lets you go through it he knew about it before it came up he is the God who is omnipresent he is Jehovah Shema the God that's always present he's everywhere at the same time when I say he's a sovereign God I'm saying he's the God of righteousness and the God of holiness he's the God of love, the God of mercy, the God that is patient, the God who is long suffering. I need a God like that on my side because in as much as I know this is a cross country run and in as much as I know that what can happen oftentimes
sometimes does happen. In as much as I know I cannot control what's going to get on the agenda of my life. I need a God on my side so that I will know that whatever's over my head is always under his feet. Come on, look at somebody say, you can't handle it, but God can. That's why we were shouting a while ago when the choir was singing, God will make a way. Because he will make a way. Uh, there, there are people who practice transcendental meditation. And when they practice transcendental meditation, uh, they want to just escape. That's all. That they just want to escape. That they ain't talking to nobody. They ain't going nowhere. They just want to escape. I've got problems. I've got, I got pressure in my life. And, and I don't know how to handle the problem. And the pressure is about to get the best of me. And I'm about to lose my mind. And many of them do because they don't understand. And they have not plugged into a power that can make a way out of no way. They, they just want to escape. So I'm going to practice transcendental meditation. And I'm going to go somewhere and sit down and just get quiet and go into space. And then when I open my, my eyes, uh, I ain't gone nowhere. I ain't talked to nobody. Ain't nothing changed. I have no new perspective about nothing that I'm dealing with. And since I ain't got no new perspective, I'm no different. And I'm no better off for what I just got in, in practicing. And my problems are still right there. But you and I, when we pray and when we meditate, we ain't trying to escape. No, we are acknowledging I got some mess going on in my life. I got problems. I'm catching hell. But I'm getting ready to go talk to somebody. I'm not escaping. I'm getting ready to have a conversation with Jesus Christ. My great high priest who identifies with my infirmities. He shares it with my suffering. And he bids me to come boldly to the throne of grace with confidence so that I can get grace and mercy in a time of need. So grandmama said, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them right there. And she said, he may not come when you want him, but whenever he shows up, he's right on time time and the reason why I didn't lose my mind and the reason I didn't have a nervous breakdown is that when I got through talking to Jesus he reminded me that I got your back he reminded me that, 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 that in all things I work for the good of those who love me and who are called according to my purpose so that I'm facing my situation a little different now my problems are there the hell is still there if you wish to purchase a copy of today's message Call 502-459-5578, extension 131. Leave your name, number, and a title of today's message.